Let's have a look at the Orion Short Tube 120 F5 Refractor. Yes, that's the big one in the series. So many of you have seen the Orion Short Tube 80. They've only made about a bazillion of those things. There was also a very short-lived Orion Short Tube 90, which very few people have seen, but this 120 millimeter, the big one, has been in the catalog for quite some time, and it's kind of flown under the radar. It's a real bargain. I mean, for $249, you get an honest-to-goodness 120 millimeters, 4.7 inches of unobstructed refractor goodness. But you want to be aware that all you get is what you see here. It's just the optical tube. So if you're an intermediate to advanced astronomer, you will probably have most of what you need to get going. You're going to need the rings, the plate, a finder, a finder bracket, a diagonal, and an eyepiece. If you're a beginner, you're going to have to get all that stuff. And even if you do have a lot of material lying around, you want to be aware that, that you're probably going to have to buy the rings. They're something like 117 millimeters. It's kind of a strange diameter. But anyway, let's put all this stuff on here and see what it looks like. And here's what it looks like, ready to go. You've got rings, plate, a finder, a finder bracket, diagonal, and an eyepiece. Now, Orion lists the weight of the optical tube at 8.6 pounds. I actually weighed it a little less. I weighed this thing at close to 8 pounds. But with everything on here, you're close to 10, 10 and a quarter pounds. You want to take that into consideration. Anyhow, uh, if you have a mount, get it on there. Let's do that and see how it looks. And here we are with the telescope mounted on a mid-sized mount. This is a Celestron CG5. You can see it works pretty well on this size mount. You probably will need the largest of the counterweights that's supplied with the mount. That is usually the one that weighs somewhere in the 11 to 13 pound range. Now, if you wanted to, you could put this on one of the small lightweight Alt-As mounts, such as the Vixen Porta, the Explore Scientific Twilight, or Orion's own Versago series. If you do use one of those alt as mounts, you can save a little bit of money. Just make sure that the eyepiece height is at a satisfactory level for you because a lot of those tend to be a little on the low side. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Yes, this telescope does have chromatic aberration or false color. If you're new at this, this manifests itself most obviously around bright objects like bright stars, the limb of the moon, or Jupiter. There will be a purple halo around those objects. Here's a picture of Vega that I took through this telescope, and you can very plainly see that blue halo. So when you were a kid, did your science teacher ever give you a prism? If they did, you could shine it up against the wall and make that pretty little rainbow against the wall. Well, if you think about it, that's the last thing you want to happen in a telescope or a microscope or a pair of binoculars or any optical instrument where accuracy is desired. Unfortunately, every piece of glass will do this to some extent. So luckily, we have some measures that we can take to mitigate this. And your first line of defense is something called an acromat, which is what this is. If you take a second piece of glass and put it next to the first piece of glass and it's shaped the right way and it's made of the right composition, you can cancel out almost all of the chromatic aberration. And for a very long time, this is how refractors were made. Now, the more aperture you have, the shorter the focal ratio, the worse the chromatic aberration, the worse the false color. This is why, for a very long time, most refractors tended to be long, skinny tubes, like this unitron you see behind me. It's only been recently that you've started to see shorter, stubbier refractors, and yes, they have chromatic aberration, but I think the philosophy is, you know, just deal with it. Now, if you really want to make the false color go away, your next line of defense is this device called an apochromatic refractor. These things are quite amazing. Refractors are completely color-free, not only in the visible spectrum, but in the photographic one as well. And they really are amazing instruments. The disadvantage is they are very expensive. So the question is, how bothersome is this chromatic aberration? And unfortunately, I can't answer that question for you because everybody has a different tolerance level, everybody has a different level of expectation, and people's experiences differ. Now, I will say this, people who have spent a lot of time looking through telescopes, the more time you spend looking through various kinds of telescopes, 
the less tolerant you tend to be of chromatic aberration. Doesn't happen with everybody, it tends to happen. Many times with beginners, I'll show them a bright star through a telescope like this and I'll just sort of mention you see the blue halo and a lot of times they'll just say it either doesn't bother them or they can't see it at all. If you're new at this, you're going to be too busy just dealing with everything else to notice little things like that. But as you get better at it, these little things may start to bother you. So did this bother me? I had this out. It's August. I looked at the ring, the dumbbell. I looked at Alberio. I split Mizar. Uh, I looked at Jupiter and Saturn. I looked at the moon. And I got to tell you, I've been accused of having expensive eyes in the past, and that's probably a fair criticism. But I had a lot of fun with this. And yeah, I noticed on brighter objects there was that little blue halo, but it didn't really bother me nearly as much as I expected. I think the worst uh, that I saw was when I looked at Jupiter, it looked as though there was some sort of an alien spaceship parked behind Jupiter with its light, the, the guy left his blue headlights on. That was really the worst I saw. But uh, really, yeah, this, it's good. I mean, if you've always been curious what a refractor looks like and you've never looked at one before, this will give you a little bit of taste of that refractor magic. Just be aware, refractoritis is an expensive disease to cure. From my skies here, my sky quality meter will read about 20.7, 20.8 here in the summertime. The dimmest objects I could see, I got M81 and M82. I got both parts of M51. I could just barely see M97 and M108. And M101 in Ursa Major was starting to be a little bit of a challenge. But still, you know, you could probably get a lot of observing out of this thing. Um, even if it's your only telescope. So Orion's website says fast F by focal ratio makes this ideal for wide field astrophotography. Now it never occurred to me to do serious deep sky astrophotography with a fast acromat, but hey, what the heck? I'm up for an adventure. Let's check it out. Before we go outside, I did try very briefly catching Jupiter through this. This is my ASI 120MC planetary imager on Jupiter. And at only 600 millimeters, I didn't even think it was going to catch anything. But not only did it get Jupiter and a disk and two cloud bands, but I think you can actually see a shadow transit going on. I think I see a little black dot on the lower left side of Jupiter. And here we are outside. And you notice I've made some changes to this telescope. The Vixen bar I swapped out for a longer one. Here's the auto guider at the end. It's an S-Big. And I've got it clamped upside down on the Vixen plate. That's not a standard thing, it's just something I do. I don't know if I'd go about copying that. DSLR, Astrotech field flattener. Notice I've got the big counterweight on the AVX. And take a quick look at the lens. It looks pretty good. Off to the other side, you see the ports. And again, this is my normal astrophotography DSLR setup. I have a friend who calls this stuff cheap Chinese speckled metal. But anyway, um, I have no idea how this is going to work, so Let's wait till sunset and uh, we'll find out together. How does this thing do on astrophotography? And we're back after an astrophotography session. I compared the Orion Short Tube 120 to an apochromatic refractor of mine. Now I actually have two apos of approximately that 600 millimeter focal length. One of them is my Takahashi FC76. The other is this astrophysics stowaway. And boy, were these results interesting. I picked two objects, the Dumbbell Nebula and the North American Nebula. Both are rising in the east here in August. So go ahead and put these pictures up. Now, I did not attempt to make this to be a scientific test. There's just too many variables to control, but just give you something idea of what the, the difference is between an APO and an Acromat. So let's go ahead and put the images of the Dumbbell Nebula up. And you see that the uh, Short Tube 120 is on the left and the Stowaway is on the right. Now you'll notice right away that there are blue halos around many or even most of the bright stars 
in the Orion Shore Tube 120. That is the result of chromatic aberration. You notice the color is gone on the stowaway. The other thing you might not notice right away, and I'm sorry, I don't know what YouTube compression is doing. I have no idea what you're seeing on your monitor right now. But the stars in the stowaway seem to take on more individual character by themselves. They're different. There's a bit of a sameness to the stars in the Orion Short Tube 120. Now, before you jump all over this thing, let's go ahead and take away the image of the stowaway. Just put the one from the Short Tube 120 up and just take a look at that. You know, when you see it by itself, it's not bad. I mean, it's actually pretty good. We have to keep in mind here, this is a $249 optical tube. It's really doing very well for itself. Let's take a look at the North American Nebula. Same thing, you'll see blue halos on the stars. And also, despite having much less aperture, the stowaway stars are smaller and there are more of them. And again, let's take away the image of the stowaway and just look at the one through the Short Tube 120. And again, that's really, really good. I mean, considering the price. And if those blue halos bother you, you actually can get rid of those in Photoshop. And I chose not to because I wanted to show the difference. If you don't do a lot of astrophotography, the last 95 seconds or so of video took about 12 and a half hours worth of work. And again, the point of this is not to tell you what to do. This telescope here costs $4,000 plus. This one is $249 just for the optical tube. Really, it's a tremendous bargain for what you get. And I think for somebody starting out, if you're just into visual astronomy and you have a mid-size mount, this will work for you. If you want to dabble your feet into astrophotography, you don't know if you like it or if you're going to be good at it, this is a really good introduction. And you can actually get some pictures out of it that you could show and you could be proud of. And there you have it, the Orion Shore Tube 120. What an amazing bargain. There seem to be so many of them out there. Do you have one of these? Do you like it? Put it in the comments below so we can all see it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.